Elijah is one of my favorite uh, Bible individuals. I have a grandson by the name of Elijah. Unfortunately, he is not quite as sold on teaching the Bible as, uh, as this Elijah that we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, our lesson is no lesson number six in this series, and I titled it God's Elijah, uh, simply because I think that there is a, a great lesson that is found of God choosing individuals. It's, it's kind of interesting when you go back through the Old Testament and you look at the prophets, oftentimes most of them were never really trained to be a, a, a prophet. Uh, Samuel developed what was called a prophet school. Uh, and, and as far as I know, none of the prophets that wrote any of the scriptures that we have uh, were graduates of that particular school. Uh, we don't know much about a lot of the prophets themselves, except the fact that the Bible says the word of the Lord came to, and whoever he was chosen, and that was it, and sort of like a tag, you're it situation. Uh, some of them were kind of reluctant. We talked about Jonah last week and how reluctant that Jonah was to go and serve. He wasn't a professional prophet as far as we know, and as far as we know, he wasn't a, a professional preacher. Uh, but he was charged to go to Nineveh and preach. He did that. The whole city repented. I've never had that happen, and it would be a wonderful thing, I would suppose. But Jonah, and in a lesson that we'll see later on in, in this series, uh, Jonah wasn't happy with the results that he got. The name Elijah means the Lord is my God. Now, to find this, I had to go to babynames.com. And I assume that they know what they're talking about. Uh, because uh, Elijah is, is a name that is oftentimes confused with Elisha. And uh, this is this is one of those things of the Old Testament that it's it's hard to remember. Well, who's Elijah and who's Elisha and which is which and, and who came first and who came second? And even the spelling of the names is very close together. And oftentimes people get Elijah and Elisha mixed up. And we have to realize that uh, there is a way that we can keep this from from being mixed up in our minds. One is, remember that Elijah and Elisha were sort of like the Paul and Timothy of the New Testament. Elijah was the older, experienced and seasoned veteran, and Elisha was the younger man in training to take the place of Elijah. In fact, uh, Elisha had no idea he was going to be a prophet either. And one day he was out plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, which is a pretty good size uh, tractor. And uh, Elijah walks along, he takes his coat off and he throws it over the shoulders of Elisha and says, tag, you're it. And uh, he says, well, I'm not too sure that that's what I want to do. And Elijah says, yes, it is. Uh, God made your mind up in, in all of this. Okay, so we ask the question, who was Elijah. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we learned from the scriptures about Elijah itself. I'm going to read you this that comes from uh, all the people in the Bible. The greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah was one of the most colorful and outspoken men in history. Born and raised in an obscure village in Gilead, uh, Elijah's entire career was a protest against the idolatry and corruption into which the northern kingdom Israel had declined. He clashed repeatedly with Ahab, the morally weak, vain king, and Jezebel, Ahab's domineering prophet's persecuting wife. Uh, of the two, Jezebel was probably the worst and the most dangerous. He was a patriot as well as a prophet, and Elijah saved his nation from going the way of Ahab and Jezebel by serving as a conscience of his country. Elijah's human qualities of fear and despair are known in the Bible. 
And after his brief victory over the false prophets on Mount Carmel, Elijah had to flee for his life and dejectedly hid in a cave on Mount Sinai until God lifted him up and sent him back to serve. He passed on his mantle to the young man Elisha, but his zeal for justice and obedience to God he imparted to all subsequent prophets. Elijah's end was mysterious. He and Enoch are the only two men in the Bible who were translated or did not see death. He was referred to repeatedly by Jesus' Jesus's contemporaries and even thought by some to have reappeared in the person of Jesus himself. Among Orthodox Jews to this very day, Elijah's return is expected at every Passover. Now, so that you got a little bit of information. We know that he was born in this obscure village in Gilead called Tishbe. And that's why he's called a Tishbite. He's from there. Like if you live here in Oak Ridge, you're an Oak Ridger. Uh, and you're not a newspaper. But you are a person from Oak Ridge. Here is a map that shows you where Tishbe really is. Uh, if you look very carefully on this map, you see where Jericho is here. Here is Shechem. Tishbe is up here. Uh, about two-thirds of the way between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it, he's in the area that's called Gilead. And what do you know about Gilead? You remember this? Huh? There is a balm in Gilead that soothes the sin-sick soul. Okay. Now, what is the balm of Gilead? Well, it is a liquid that is secreted by this particular tree. Uh, <coughs> sometimes it's known as nard. Uh, but more and often it is, is used in a cream solution, uh, often mixed with olive oil, and is used as a soothing uh, skin cream. And it has a very nice aromatic, aromatic, aromatic odor to it. And so we're familiar with the balm of Gilead. We sing about it, even though we may not know it. It's like the song which says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Uh, do you know what an Ebenezer was? Uh, an Ebenezer was a stone pillar. It's a sign that that's where God had been. So there are a lot of things in the scriptures sometimes that we just take for granted. We look at it, we read it, and we just keep going because we don't take time to, to look them up and see what, what we, what, what's really there. Not only was he born in, at Tishba, but he was thought of as the fiery prophet who breathed fire and brimstone to a disobedient and indifferent people of his day and time. He lived in a day and time in which Israel was a divided kingdom. It was divided into the northern and the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, which really only entailed uh, uh, about two and a half of the tribes and the rest of the tribes had gone uh, liberal uh, with the tribes in the north of Israel and uh, they were... Uh, getting further and further away. And Elijah was one of those that was sent back to, uh, to help straighten them out. He prophesied between the years of 876 and 850, about 25 years. Uh, the rulers on the throne were Ahab and Jezebel and Ahaziah. And probably the only contemporary prophet of his day and time that we know of was Joel. And uh, Joel also spoke to a lot of the same things that Elijah did. Here's a picture of Elijah confronting King Ahab and Jezebel. And the look on her face will really tell you the, about the character of that particular woman. Here he is preaching to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, his wife. She was a real, uh, a real story all, all by herself. Uh, she, she would make an interesting study. I don't think we get into that in any of the, uh, the lessons that are in this particular series. 
but may a little bit later on. His message basically was the same that all the prophets of God came to deliver. Straighten up, fly right, and return to God. I, you know, what's the message of preaching today? Straighten up, fly right, and return to God. Uh, what did Jesus preach? Repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. Basically, straighten up, fly right, and return to God. Uh, that's the whole purpose of, of what we as preachers are supposed to be doing. Elijah served in some very difficult times. Uh, it was uh, a very uh, testy time uh, for him to live. He was in being threatened uh, to be killed several times. He served during the reign of the most notorious king and queen ever known in Israel, that of Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, here's a picture I, I found that I thought was really interesting. You, you remember the story about Naboth? Naboth had a vineyard that wasn't far from, from the palace. And Ahab saw this great vineyard and he wanted that great vineyard and he actually made himself sick because he, he pined over wanting this so badly. And here he is telling Jezebel, he says, see that? He says, I'd like to have it. I want to have it. And I can't have it. Uh, and Jezebel uh, plots to kill Naboth and give the vineyard to the king. And she does. And I hope that made him happy. Uh, I'm not too sure. There was a lot of things that made King Ahab, Ahab happy. But uh, that's just one of those things. Lessons that we can learn from Elijah. He was a man of like passion or feelings like we are. And this is even stated in the New Testament. Uh, in James 5, 17 and 18, Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it didn't rain on the earth he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. Uh, it's kind of interesting to notice even uh, when he prays, he's instructed by God to do this. And so he prays, and this is what takes, takes place. A three-year, six-month drought uh, makes a tremendous famine. Uh, nothing grows during that period of time. If there's no rain, uh, you don't have to cut your grass. Uh, the bugs die off because there's nothing for them to eat uh, and the rabbits and the other uh, varmints that help clean up stuff around your house die off because there's nothing for them to eat too. And it was just one of those sad times. We learned from Elijah that he had hunger and he needed help at times just like we do. The Bible says in 1 Kings 17 beginning with verse 1, now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Uh, God had told him, instructed him to say this. And he says, The word of God came to him saying, Go from here, go eastward, hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan, and you shall drink from the wadi, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the wadi. Now, this is kind of interesting. Another translation says a creek. Uh, a wadi is usually associated as being a conduit of water after a, a, after a rain. Wadis are usually dry. And they usually have no water that's in them. So that makes it a little difficult to understand this particular translation. But in, on maps, Cherith is called a brook or a creek. Uh, in which water runs all of the time. Here's a picture I find, found of the ravens bringing bread and meat to Elijah. And you notice the water that is running there. So it's more than a, a dry wash uh, of any kind. Uh, when we were in Israel in 1984, 
uh, we went to Qumran. And uh, one of the interesting things was Qumran is at the opening of Qumran Wadi. And there is no water that flows through there except after a rainstorm. And when there's a rainstorm, it's almost a river. And it flows into the Dead Sea. Uh, now, I, I don't know. I guess these were nice, clean birds uh, to bring him bread and meat. And if they're like the ravens that we have in East Tennessee, uh, they were picking up roadkill. Uh, and I doubt in those days and times that there was an awful lot of roadkill. Uh, but uh, somehow or another, as God made this available to them, uh, the ravens uh, took care of, of Elijah. Very strange thing, but one of those miracles that uh, we read about in the scriptures. Also, the widow of Zarephath took care of him. Do uh, you remember the story about the widow of Zarephath? Any of you? This was a widow woman who had just enough meal and just enough oil to make one more cake left over, and Elijah shows up and he says, fix me something to eat. And she says, well, I don't have enough to feed me and my son. And Elijah says, well, take care of me and it'll be taken care of. So she makes the cake, she feeds him, and strangely enough, for the three years that he's there at her house, the oil never runs out and the meal never runs out. Another wonderful miracle that takes place. And here's a good picture that shows it. The young boy is all excited about the fact there's still something to eat. And she takes care uh, of Elijah. We also find out that Elijah is not afraid of King Ahab, but he runs and he hides from Queen Jezebel. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, men's relationships to humans, human beings are still about the same. Two guys get together and they fight. But a woman gets her, her dander up and the fellow will run. He'll go and hide. And that hasn't changed in, in centuries. Here's a picture of Jezebel, and she's pointing her finger at Elijah, and she vows that she's going to kill Elijah. Elijah runs away from her, and he goes and he hides. Uh, she really gets her dander up after he kills uh, all the prophets on Mount Carmel. And she really uh, gets upset over that because 400 of them came and ate at her table every day. This is a way that is spoken of in 1 Kings 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and had killed all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and he said, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So he was afraid. He got up, he fled for his life, and he came to Beersheba. Uh, that's not really the way it's supposed to be spelled. It's, it's probably pronounced Beersheba. But oftentimes in the English, it comes out Beersheba. Uh, don't think it has anything to do with beer at all. It's just the name of, uh, it's the, just the, the, the Jewish name of that particular place which belongs to the tribe of Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. And he asked that he might die. It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm the same as being as dead as they are already dead. Uh, going to the garden to eat worms. Uh, Elijah is a man of up and downs. And sometimes he is so brazen that he will sit there and in the face of the king and the queen, point his finger and tell him what God says. And almost in the next instance here, he's hiding, scared to death, knowing that they're going to kill him or believing that they're going to kill him. But God wasn't through with him. Here he is underneath the broom tree. Uh, 
I do not know what kind of tree that a broom tree was, but I assume that because of the way the branches were, that oftentimes they were cut off and made into a broom. And that's probably how it got its name. There he is under the broom tree. He's ready to die. Uh, this reminds me of, you remember when Hagar uh, was cast out by Sarah? She goes out into the desert. She gets under the tree. She's going to die there with her son Ishmael. And the angel comes to her and says, get up. We've got some more stuff for you to get do and, and to Im improve in, in your life and the life of others. Also, we find that Elijah became discouraged at times like us in his service to God. There is nothing that is more frustrating than preaching the word of God. There is nothing that is more rewarding than preaching the word of God. Now, if you've never done it, you won't understand that. But both of those statements are equally true. You can preach your heart out and you know that somebody needs to respond and they don't. And then sometimes uh, you deliver what you consider one of your worst sermons and four or five people come down the aisle. It just it doesn't make, make sense. But it's not supposed to. You're supposed to teach the Word of God. Let the Word of God work upon those individuals. And as God works upon them, uh, then there is a response that comes when they open up and listen to what God says. Here's a picture of somebody has painted of Elijah in the cave. When he says, I'm here, Lord, just take my life. I am no better off than my dead ancestors. So he became very discouraged at times in his service to God. 1 Kings 19 and 4 says, He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree and he asked that he might die. It is enough now, Lord, just take away my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He says, I failed. I am miserable. Just take my life. And another place in the same chapter, uh, he leaves the broom tree and he goes and finds a cave. He spends the night there and the word of the Lord came to him. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, pretty good pretty good conversational starter. And he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. They have killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone, I am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. So he's complaining to God. God says, get up. I got some more stuff for you to do. Uh, and most of the time, that's true for all of us. We forget that we are on God's time schedule and not ours. But we look at our watches. We look at the clock on the wall. Uh, we look at our, our phones to find out what time it is and see if the preacher's about ready to quit. Keep waiting for that time, he says, and in conclusion, uh, and uh, we're hopeful that it won't be more than another 15 or 20 minutes after he says that. Well, I quit using that terminology years ago and found it was people like to be surprised. When the lesson was over, it was over. And wow, I didn't know. I, I thought she was going to go on for a little bit longer. Well, not always. We also find that Elijah was a man of obedience. Uh, he went promptly to King Ahab to deliver God's message. Uh, this reminds me of Abraham when God said, I want you to go to a place and I'll show it to you when you get there. I want you to take your son. I want you to sacrifice him to me. The Bible says Abraham the next morning got up early the next morning. He saddled his donkey. He put the food, put the wood upon the donkey. He, put, uh, he took the fire in, in, a, in a pot. He took his son. He took everything that he needed. Uh, he didn't say, okay, can I have three days with him? Uh, it doesn't even say that he explained it to Sarah. He just did what God said to do. And how good the world would be today if people would just simply do as soon as they heard it what God said to do. In 1 Kings 18 and 1, after many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year of the drought saying, Go and present yourself to Ahab 
and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and the famine was severe in Samaria. In 1 Kings 21, beginning with verse 17, uh, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Go down and meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He's now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he's gone to take possession. You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. So Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And Elijah answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord says, I will bring disaster on you. I will consume you. I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And the lineage of Abraham dies with him. Because he was an evil king. Now, I think it's kind of interesting when you go to reading uh, the scriptures that in the divided kingdom, it is revealed to us what took place in Israel, and it's also revealed to us what took place in Judah, and, and how that there was contention between these two elements, the north and the south, uh, for a great many of years. And it was just a, a, a terrible situation. There's Elijah. He's in the presence of the king. He delivers the message to King Ahab. He's pointing his finger. He's telling him what's going to happen. Jezebel doesn't look so cantankerous and dangerous at that particular point. But Ahab looks a little startled in that particular picture. One of the lessons that we learn is that obedience is always better than sacrifice. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I may have told you this before. Uh, when I moved to one place where I was preaching, uh, the elders handed me a list, which they had also handed the previous three preachers, and said, we want you to work on these people. <laughs> they used to come to church here, now they don't come anymore. And one of those names, uh, the man's wife and, and his two daughters, uh, came to church very faithfully. But uh, this man was as redneck as anybody that ever was that lived. His life was wrapped up in building race cars. He was as good a mechanic as there ever was. And it's, it's interesting to note that over the years in working with him, that eventually he did come back. And it was also interesting to find out that also uh, when he died, his family asked me to come and to, to deliver the eulogy at, at his funeral. And I did. Uh, you don't know how you're going to reach some people. You don't know how that they're going to respond, and you don't know how long it's going to take for them to respond. But it's also interesting to notice that it's not up to us as individuals, but it's the Word of God that works upon on individuals. Obedience is always better than sacrifice. You remember the story about uh, Samuel and King Saul? God came down and, and, and told Samuel, you have to go to King Saul, tell him, said, I want you to go down and slaughter the Amalekites, kill all the men, kill all the women, kill all the children, kill all the animals, don't take anything as spoil, just wipe them out. And Samuel tells Saul, he says, now, you wait until I come and offer sacrifice, and then you can go down there and do this. And Saul Samuel delays coming. Saul gets upset. He's got his army ready and he's ready to go. They stomp off down to uh, the area where the Amalekites live. Kills them all off except uh, uh, the king uh, Agag. And they bring back the best of the sheep and the best of the oxen. And on the way back, there in the middle of the road stands Samuel. 
Samuel crosses his arms across his chest and he says, what is this that I hear? Saul looks surprised and he says, well, we have brought back the best to, to sacrifice it to God. Samuel says, that's not what you were told to do. You did what was, you did eventually do what God said to do, but you didn't do it like God said to do it. This is kind of interesting. In 1 Samuel 15, Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Surely to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is no less a sin than divination and stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. It's a great lesson in this. Rebellion, rebellion and stubbornness. Uh, we live in a day and an age of religion that falls into both of these categories. Rebellion in saying we're not going to do it like God said to do it. And stubbornness in saying we're doing it like this and, and, and nobody's going to change us. And we're probably about as guilty in the church of the stubbornness situation as anybody ever has been. And so we need to be very careful that we understand and that we look at the scriptures and find the lesson that is there uh, for us. We must obey God in order to be saved. We have to listen to him, we have to know his word, and we have to do his word. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 and 8, even though he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. If we obey Jesus, then we obey God, because God sent him. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. We're not given a right to deviate from it, either to the right or to the left. In Mark 16, 15, he said to his disciples as he was teaching, telling them to go out and preach to the whole world, Go into, the whole, into the, all the world, proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. We live in a day and an era of what is called toleration. That means that we are to accept regardless of how we feel or what we think. Uh, I, one of the difficult things in our day and time is, is learning to share with folks that the Bible teaches something that they don't practice. Uh, for the Orthodox Jews of our day and time, they're not going to make it to heaven because they don't trust in Jesus. The Muslims are not going to make it to heaven. Uh, because they don't trust in Jesus. There are other religions in the world that don't trust in Jesus, and they're not going to be there either. And it's not going to be like that joke that says when you get to heaven and uh, they go by and they said, uh, who, who are these people over here? And they said, well, that's the Church of Christ people. said, but be quiet. They think they're the only ones here. We will probably not be the only ones there but there may not be as many of us as we think so because of our stubbornness and because of our rebellion. Lessons we can learn from Elijah, he was a righteous man. James 5, 16 and 17 says, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And Elijah was a human being like us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three years and six months it didn't rain on the earth and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded his harvest. Why did God answer his prayers? 
because of his relationship to God. Not his relationship to the king, not his relationship to the people of Israel, but his relationship with the God of heaven. Elijah was not perfect, but he was right in the sight of God. Now, this is hard for us to understand. When we read passages like which is found in Matthew, be ye perfect uh, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Uh, that's difficult for us. We, we, we write it off and say, well, no man can be perfect. Yes, you can. You're perfect in Jesus Christ. It is Christ that makes you perfect. It's not what you do that makes you perfect. And it was Elijah's relationship to God that made him perfect. It made him righteous. So we have to ask this question, what is righteousness? Anybody want to answer? Mm -hmm. All this wisdom of all these years of all these people are in here. Here it's explained in the scriptures. If you dig deep enough, you'll find the answer. In Psalms 119, 172, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Whatever God says is righteous. If you do what God says, you're righteous. It, it, you'd have to have help to misunderstand that. Elijah was a man who did what God commanded. That's what made him righteous in the sight of God. Not perfect, but right, because he did what God said. Now, who is righteous? In 1 John 3 and 7, the Bible says, Little, ch little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. If you do what's right, you're righteous in the sight of God. In Romans 10, 1 and 2, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer for God, for them, for Israel, is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not uh, enlightened. It is not, it has not been proven what they have according to the scriptures. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not sub submitted to God's righteousness. They have not submitted to God's righteousness. What did we say that righteousness was? The commands of God. At least... God's Word says that. Who is righteous? Those who do what God commands. Those who obey what God commands. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one that does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And I'll declare unto them, I never knew you. Go away from me, ye evildoers. It'll be a sad scene for a lot of folks. And I guess that's why people fear death so much. But for the Christian, death is nothing to fear. It just gets me closer to the time that I can live forever in heaven with God. We also learn that Elijah was the prophet was uh, the prophet of God was a praying man. He prayed for it not to rain. He says, "There shall neither be dew nor rain all of these years except by my word." What word is prayer to God? God told him what to pray for. God tells us what to pray for. You read the Word. You find out what you're supposed to pray for. In James 5, 16, it says, The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And he was a human being. Elijah was a human being like us. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. 
For the three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. Have you ever wondered sometimes why you feel like that your prayers are not answered? Well, I think God answers prayers in, in basically three ways. One, he says yes. One, he says no. And one says not now. And, and like I said earlier, we have to be very careful and remember that we are not on our time schedule, even though our life is short upon this earth. We are here doing the effectiveness will of God where we are at the time that we are. And not only do we affect the people that we know now, but we may leave a legacy that people will remember for years. And so we need to be careful how we deal with our family. We need to be careful about how we deal with the people that we work with and the people that we meet every, every single day. I'm afraid that our land is forgetting this. And 1 Kings 18, Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, because there's the sound of rushing rain. This was after he'd killed the prophets on Mount Carmel. This is after he uh, was getting ready to go back uh, away from this place. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And there he bowed himself down to the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, well, go up now. What was he doing? Uh, this is a posture of prayer. He tells his servant, go up and look toward the sea. The servant went and looked. And he says, there's nothing there. He says, go look seven times. And the seventh time he said, look, a little cloud no bigger than a person's hand is rising up out of the sea. And he said, now you go to Ahab and tell him, harness your chariot and get down before the rain stops you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain and Ahab rode off and went to Jezreel. Why does that happen? Why are prayers heard and answered? I, when I teach the subject of prayer, I love to teach about Cornelius. Here is a man that was not a Christian. He wasn't a Jew. And the Bible says, and the angel explains to him, he says, your prayers have come up as a memorial before God. You see, when we talk to people about their relationship to God, we shouldn't start where they're wrong. We need to start from their strong point. And the angel didn't come to Cornelius and say, hey man, you're doing it all wrong. He said, your prayers have come up before God as a memorial. Now we don't know what memorial it was, uh, what was instituted in all of this, but God heard it, God listened to it, and God sent him an opening to become a Christian through Jesus Christ. First John 3, 22 says, we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. Not what pleases all of these people, not what pleases me, but what pleases God. And here's his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. Righteousness are the, is the commands of God. When we do what God says, we are righteous. And Jesus is our example in all of this. The Bible says, in the morning while it was still very dark, he got up and he went to a deserted place and there he prayed. I don't know when you pray. I don't know where you pray. But as a child of God, that should be part of your life. All 
that great men are men of prayer. All great women are women of prayer. I'm very proud of the prayer group that we have here, our women's prayer group. We need a men's prayer group. You can quote me on that. We need to pray to God always. Why? Because this is what the Bible says. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for the cause. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What does God, God, God want? He wants to talk, talk to him. He wants, he wants us to pray, pray to, him. to him. We also, we also find out Elijah was a man of courage. He stood, he stood before, King before King Ahab, Ahab and dimmed him. 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 You know, you know you, if there's one, if there's one thing, thing to say about Elijah, he was not wishy-washy. Wishy -washy. You know, we know, we've gotten to the point in our life today that we don't have to have our heart in anybody. And the point, and the point is, is, is that sometimes, sometimes we've got, we've to, got have to have enough backbone to be able to stand up and say, and say what you're what doing, you're doing is, wrong. is wrong. They have they saw Elijah, and they, they have said, said, said to him, is it you, 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 you trouble, trouble Israel? 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 And he answered, he answered I'm not trouble Israel, 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 you have. You have. And your father's father's house, because they can say, and the man was born, and all the body of males. Was he done? Was he done? Forsaken, they can man the man the Lord the Lord. Was they have right and righteous? Uh, no way. No way. Why? Why? Because he was he was not man the man the Lord. First Kings First 21, 21, 19, 19 again, he, says, he says, God says, God says to Elijah, go to him and just what you're going to say. To say. Thus says the Lord, the Lord, you have you killed, killed and also and taken possession. possession. You shall say, you shall to, say him, to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Laban, the dogs are also licked up your blood. blood. And Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, and said, I've found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And I will bring disaster upon you, I will consume you, I will cut you off, cut off from Ahab every male bonder free in Israel, and I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baishah, the son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and caused Israel to sin. What we do may cause somebody else to sin. And we will be held accountable. Elijah was a man of courage. He was unmoved by being outnumbered by the prophets of Baal. In 1 Kings 18, 19... He says, Now therefore have all of Israel assembled for me at Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent to all the Israelites and they assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. 850 to 1. What kind of odds <laughs> are those? It's bad enough to have 450 of the prophets of Baal to start with or 400 prophets of Asherah. You put them together, you got 850. That's quite a, quite a large group of folks. That's not as many as will meet at uh, Nayland Stadium in two or three weeks. But it's a whole different purpose. Elijah says we're going to have a contest. You guys are going to build an altar and I'm going to build an altar. And you're going to put a sacrifice on it, and I'm going to put a sacrifice on mine. And you're going to call on your God to send down fire and consume that sacrifice. And I'm going to do the same thing. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. This is really one of the funny stories in the scriptures. 850 guys beating a path around their altar, waving their arms, shouting and calling, and no matter what, you can just imagine what all was going on with all these guys around it. Looked like chaos, probably was. 
There's Elijah standing there. These guys have gone on almost all day long. And Elijah teases them and says, maybe your God is asleep or maybe he, is, he, he can't hear you or, or maybe he's gone to sleep. And they get real upset. And they shout louder and stronger and they even start cutting themselves with knives in order to contact their God. And it doesn't work. And at evening, Elijah says, all right, watch this. And he goes over to the altar that he's built and he digs a trench around it. And he calls for 12 barrels of water. Not 12 buckets, but 12 barrels of water. And they pour it on the altar and it fills the trench around the altar and everything is just soaked like crazy. And you know how easy it is to start a fire with wet wood and wet paper. You know, it just doesn't work, does it? What happens? Fire from heaven comes down. It consumes the sacrifice. It consumes the rocks. It laps up all the water that's, that's in the trenches that's there. And the people began to shout, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah takes a sword and he kills the 850 false prophets there on Mount Carmel. 1984, when we took our tour, I stood on Mount Carmel. I would have liked to have seen the place where all of this took place. But just knowing that you were on that mountain and it's easy to see when you look at, at a map of, of Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, there's one little prominence, like a finger, that sticks out into the ocean, and that's Mount Carmel. It is in the lee side of that prominence uh, where Joppa is, and that was where, the, uh, where Tyre and Sidon are, and those were the basic uh, seaports of that day and time. What are some of the lessons for us from Elijah? One, we have to have courage to stand against evil. It's not easy. It's tough. And sometimes it's really tough. Secondly, we must stand even, we have, even if we have to stand alone. Uh, you can say to everybody, come on, let's go. And most of the time, you're going to be the only one that's going to go most of the time. Once in a while, you might get somebody to go with you, but very rarely will you ever get everybody to go along with you. We need to have the same type of faith like Elijah, a faith that moves us to do God's will. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the world is doing. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And remember this, and if this, if this is the only thing you remember about this lesson, we are the heroes of faith for our day and time. What we do now will make a difference upon our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. I'm supposed to preach on the 1st of September, and my granddaughter and grandson are going to bring my great-grandson to hear their great-grandfather preach. Now, he probably won't know what's going on. He may throw a fit. He may not like what I'm going to preach on. I don't. It doesn't make any difference. He may hoop and cry. Hopefully, he'll be as good as he was last time he was here. Don't count on it. And finally, God needs us to stand for him and proclaim his word to our generation. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. It's up to us. Our next lesson will be lesson seven in this series. Life is what you make it. Life is what you make it. We're going to be looking at a number of different people in the scriptures and what they did with their life and what made them successful and what made them failures. I thank you for being such an attentive class tonight. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you.
Our time is up. You are dismissed.